there is a saying, you can take the boy out of Salford, but you can't take Salford out of the boy. Times were hard. We did things we shouldn't have done, but we did them to survive, really. Don't forget, there was no real home life. You were just on your own. But I certainly don't regret any of the things I've done, because I've done them for a purpose. I haven't been at Manchester for quite a while now, it must be 30 years. Things have changed a lot since I was there. Bred and born in Salford, you never forget it. You just can't forget it. When you were so young, you didn't really realise they were bad memories. Everything was just normal, really. But when you look back as you get older, they, they were quite bad. You never forget it. It exists in your mind. You know, I can remember things I did at six years of age. It's nice to be back in Manchester, but you don't feel any emotional until you actually go over this bridge. Because once you cross over this bridge, you're into Salford. There's Old Trafford football ground in front of us. When I was a little, I must have been about eight. So everybody used to come back here to watch the game and park in our street. And we used to ask them if we could look after the cars. Some of them, was like, uh, some of them used to try and give us a clip round here for being so cheeky. And then when they'd gone and we got enough, we used to go to the game as well. We used to run up to Old Trafford, but we used to be able to sneak in. We never paid. They had a turnstile at the front, but the bars were so wide and we were so skinny, we could get between the bars and sneak in. But we always had to be back before the end of the game to collect our money. My dad found out he'd more than likely give me a good idea, which I had plenty of. We were just out all day. We'd get up in the morning, go out, and not go back till night. That's the way it was. We never asked any questions. When we got home, my dad wasn't there anyway. He was at the pub. He's changed so much. Changed so much. This is the original Monmouth Street, where I was fixed at. My house was just over there. You can't vision it. I mean, it used to be all back-to-back -back houses. I can't name how many houses was here. They were just all streets all the way through. A real community. It really was. You never, ever lock your door. Feeling quite emotional now, standing here. Down here used to be the coal barges and that's where my mum used to send us with a pram to get the coal. Me and my sister Maureen used to come down here, go on the barges, get the coal and then push it all the way back to Monmouth Street and we worked out if we went twice we could sell a pram full. So we used to drop one off at home, come back, get another one knock on some doors around our streets and see if they wanted to buy the coal. Till one night, there was a policeman waiting at the top for us. This is the doorway where the policeman stopped us with the coal. And he rang for a police car to come and take us down. Well, we'd been over to the soft drinks factory to get our soft drinks and all. We ended up with pocketfuls of bottle openers, believe it or not. I don't know why. So the policeman was stood out on the road, wasn't looking at us. So what we did, we both of them all through the letterbox in this doorway. They did take the coal off us and get rid of it. 
and it didn't really matter because we just went back the next night and got some more. Yeah. Fond memories, aren't they? <laughs> I can remember one, I was about eight, and my mum used to get me to run a note for her for some reason at Odso Lane to a bloke, but I didn't know who he was. I didn't take any notes of it. And then one day, I hadn't been to school, I went home a bit earlier, and I couldn't get in. <laughs> anyway, the neighbour was at the door next door. She said, what's the matter? I said, I can't get in. She said, we'll climb over the wall and go in the back door. And as you climb over the wall, you can see into the, like, the living room. And there was me mum on the settee with this bloke I'd been taking the notes to. I thought then they were a bit friendly. She told me off and told me not to tell me dad. So I didn't. Anyway, this morning we got up. Mum said, oh, you're not going to school today. And she started packing. I packed it all together, packed the pram. And off we went. We left the house, walked across the croft. Got to night time, we was in a park. And we went to sleep on a bench all night. Up the next morning, roaming round again. And the following night we ended up on a railway station. And we slept in a waiting room. We ended up in Liverpool anyway, one bed, it seemed ages, but actually it was only a few months. Then one Sunday morning, we got up, she dressed, dressed Paul in, and Mum put us on the coach in Liverpool and told the coach driver to drop us at Trafford Bar. We got on, got on the back seat, let's have a back seat, and there she was waving at us. And that was it. I never seen my mum again for about three years. Anyway, my dad greeted us, he took one look at us, and he just stripped us off naked. Made us stand in the lobby, and he went and got all the neighbours to show him what a state we was in. We was bitten everywhere. We flee all over. It was bolting day. It was May. I ain't 49. I was only six. Got to the school, the school had railings like that around and they had the boards up to say vote for whoever and of course we wanted to climb up and have a look in so I climbed up and the board slipped and I went down on the spike and all I can remember then is one of the dock coppers come and he sort of lifted me off because I weighed nothing, I was only a tiny little thing I can remember him pushing cotton wool in an hole here, right in my stomach, before I went to the hospital. Down on the right there used to be the box factory, and it had quite a big doorway. And my dad used to kick me out at night, or I used to leg it to save me having a good hiding. And I used to spend the night in the doorway. I mean, I was very young, or oh, ten. I spent many a night in that doorway. He didn't have a clue where I was, because if he'd have found me, they'd give me a good hiding. And bloody freedom. It was freedom. But then, that was it. I used to leave there in the morning. Usually I used to go around with my Auntie Polly, who lived in Little Mumba Street here. I'd knock on her door. I didn't used to go at the night, because I didn't want to wake him up, you know. You didn't get anything for Christmas. You might as well have forgot about Christmas. You put your stocking out as old kids do. All you used to get in it mate, was maybe an apple and an orange. You never had any toys. They just couldn't afford toys. You know, that was out of the question. Christmas has come and went. <laughs> you didn't know much about them. One friend I lost under the bridge. He'd gone chasing the pigeons, he fell in the canal. We didn't find them until about three or four days later. About half a mile down the canal. Yeah. I got into a spot of bomb when I had to go to court. My dad turned up at court the first time with the judge was asking my dad one or two questions. And my dad just turned straight round to him and said I can't handle him, just send him away. And I got put away. About three years. 
was 15 at the Christmas and they let me out after that. I honestly think that was one of the best things ever happened to me. I was getting three meals a day, a clean bed, and I was having a bit of schooling. This is something I'd never had before. I mean, I lived in Salford. You never had blankets on the bed, you just had army coats. It was a bit of shoe army. Even at that age. I went to the school in Wales. And I was there for near enough three years. And in the three years, I didn't have a visitor until the headmaster came to see me and said, you've got a visitor, Ken. Your mother's coming to see you. And I thought, I wonder who that could be. And he walked me to the main old way and I looked at her. And I haven't seen her for nearly seven, eight years. I just didn't recognise her. She was completely different. But it took me a long time to get used to the idea that, that she'd come back in my life, really. I think she was a little bit... a little bit ashamed. It struck me that way. It made me more determined. I love my family. I really do. And I, I, I think that's one of the reasons why, because I never had it. My oldest sister, Maureen, was more a mum to me than my mum had ever had. Right then, here we are, on our way home. Get home and see Jan. I bet she's missed me. Well, I gotta admit, Salford, now to me, is a distant memory. I was glad to get away really. When I came down here, what was I, I was 17. Excited I suppose. It was it was a new adventure. Just at home now, we're gonna back in the drive and we're gonna see the love of my life. And I bet you're fiver she's got the kettle on. Thank you. How are you? Bye. 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 We met at the youth club. Yeah, yeah. Mm. God, that was a long time ago. It was. I did some, didn't I? You were dancing with somebody else. That was it, and I bumped into you. And you bumped you. into me, you stood on my foot. That was it, and you hit me. <laughs> yeah. I walloped him across the shoulder. <laughs> Thought he was an annoying little whatever. <laughs> he was a real Jack the Lad. Typical, um, what shall we say? Catch. Oh, Good catch. No, I don't think so. No. Not at the time, no. <laughs> he pestered the life out of me. Well, got there in the end. That's a northerner coming out on me. You never give up. We got married because I was expecting our first child. And it was what you did. And our honeymoon <laughs> was spent <laughs> in a caravan and the yeah, Isle of Wight. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my dad loved him right from right from the start because he was so open and a Jack the Lad, and uh, my dad just took took to him. But Mum was a little bit more apprehensive because I suppose she could see the the devil in him. I don't know. I always said to Jan, they were the parents really I never had. He's always got a smile on his face. He's never miserable. He can always make me laugh. He loves his family. Like it's nothing better than to be surrounded by him. He loves life. He doesn't dwell on the past. You know, he never lets it get him down. He hasn't got a chip on his shoulder. So, I mean, uh, his experiences were what well, we could never imagine. 54 years later, one son, three grandchildren, four great-grandchildren, and we did it together. <laughs> <laughs>